Hello, everyone, and welcome to my second podcast episode ever. And you know, <laughs> I decided to uh, launch a podcast uh, last week. And uh, then this week, I decided to go ride roller coasters all day with my best friend for her birthday. And I've officially lost my voice. So now I have this sexy phone operator voice going on. So forgive me. I'm not exactly sure how long my voice will last, but I am here. I am committed. And I really wanted to record today's podcast episode um, because it is such an important topic to me. And it's literally what I'm going to be writing my book about. And so um, this week's podcast episode is, I just, I just want to talk really openly and honestly with you about difficult times. And I think a lot of us, well, I know all of us go through difficult times and challenging times in life. And, you know, I feel like as we develop and as we go through life, we start to really mature in the way we react to difficult times and how we view them and how we move forward through a difficult time. And when it comes to business and marketing and having success in life financially or what have you, a lot of it comes down to mindset. In fact, I would say if your mindset's not in the right place, then you're not going to have success no matter how good you are at something. If your mindset is in the gutter and you are struggling with, with your mindset and your belief and your spirit, um, you're going to only get so far. And I want to encourage you in terms of difficult situations because you might know this already, but I think it helps to remind people and to hear a reminder that when it comes to difficult times, difficult times shape us. They make us who we are. They strengthen us. And difficult, challenging times create very strong people and strong people create strong businesses and strong people create change in the world. So if you're going through a challenging time in life right now, first of all, I just want to encourage you and remind you that you're going through something that is happening for you, not to you. Whatever you might believe, God, spirit, universe, world, energy, what is happening to you is happening for you. And if you can see it that way, you can really view it as this situation that is shaping you for the future were whatever the bigger picture may be, the bigger, more important purpose and meaning in life. And so if you're at the beginning stages of your business or you're at the beginning stages of life, say you're in high school or you're in, get just in college or you're a young adult in your 20s and you're maybe you're going through something really challenging and difficult, just know that this is temporary and it is going to subside. You are going to heal. It's going to stop feeling so tragic and you're going to move forward and you're going to become more resilient. And resiliency is so critical when it comes to developing a business and when it comes to creating success in life. Say you're not in the world of business and say maybe you are um, in the, you know, in the world of service. Well, in order to be resilient in terms of the world of service, then you absolutely need to be resilient in your mind and your body and your spirit. Um, I used to be in case management back in my early twenties, right after college. And let me tell you what, I was not resilient enough to handle that case management, working in case management with homeless, um, and drug addicted men and women. And I was not resilient enough. Now, today, I absolutely would likely be able to crush that job and stick around and be mentally sound and strong enough. Um, but back then, back in my early 20s, there's no way. There's no way I would have been able to handle um, that job. So whatever you're going through right now in life, it is shaping you. And it is setting the pay, it's it's setting down the foundation for what's to come next. I saw a uh TikTok today of this girl crying about her acne. And this sweet guy got on and he said, 
oh, it's going to get better. I promise this acne, while it's terrible and it hurts and it's, and people are paying attention to it and they don't have to deal with it like you do. Just know that that acne is shaping you into a resilient, beautiful human um, on the inside. And it's so true. It's so true. Our most painful moments shape us. Um, and it's really hard to remember that when we're going through the thick of it. My goodness, I wish I had somebody in my ear telling me all of this. Um, just a few short years ago, when I was going through some of the most um, difficult times of my life. Um, so I want to take you guys back first. I'm going to take a sip of my water because uh, roller coasters. My best friend and I decided that we were going to get fast passes and we were going to ride every roller coaster at Universal and IOA. And we did it. We rode them all. And in fact, we were, we rode one of them twice and we screamed our heads off like kids. It was amazing. Okay. So I want to take you back to my childhood and I want to, I want to paint a picture for you. Imagine you're a little girl, you're, you're six years old and you're obsessed with your father. Your father is your entire world. You look up to him. You love him. You cherish him. He makes you laugh. You are daddy's girl. And, um, it's just this pure blissful love. And that's, that's the relationship I had with my dad as a little girl. I remember it. Um, like it was yesterday. I used to sit in the passenger seat of my dad's car when I wasn't supposed to, this was the nineties. And I would just laugh at my dad's jokes and he would tell me about the world and I would just look at him with such awe and, and just loved him so much. And he was my favorite parent, mom. I'm sorry if you're listening, but back then dad was funny and exciting and he brought me so much joy and he taught me how to ride a bike. He taught me how to use a fork and knife. He, you know, he was everything to me and, and, and my parents were everything to me. And I started to notice this strange behavior in my dad, he started to become more reclusive. I started to notice that he was sleeping all day and smoking more and more cigarettes and gaining weight. And um, he would disappear. And then I would, you know, not see him for days on end because he'd lock himself in his room. Um, I started to notice that he was crying every now and again. And my parents began fighting a lot. And, um, my dad and my mom would have these screaming matches and they would throw things and it broke my heart. I was only six, six or seven. And I would throw up from the anxiety of it all. All I remember throwing up all over my parents one night when my parents got into a huge fight, I got in the way of them just like pushing and shoving and I got thrown out of the way and I hit the wall and that anxiety made me throw up. And that was right around the time that I realized I was beginning to have anxiety. I didn't realize it then, but I know now at like six or seven, I had really bad anxiety. I would throw up all the time from just feeling uneasy and scared. And as my dad got more and more reclusive, he began gaining more and more weight and be began talking to himself. And I remember every other day, it was like my parent, my mom would be very sad and upset. And there was all of this and I didn't understand any of it. I had no idea what was going on. And then I started to notice that my mom was packing boxes up. And, um, she was packing our stuff away and she was labeling these boxes and I didn't understand what was happening. And they didn't really tell me a lot because I was a little kid, but my dad would take me to do fun things and try to get me out of the house. And he would pretend like nothing was wrong. And then one day my dad and my mom said to tell, to go and say goodbye to my dad. And we were going to get in the car and we were going to Florida where I am right now. And my mom hurried me over. My dad was sitting in his underwear on the porch crying. 
And I got in his lap and I held him and I couldn't understand why he was so upset. And he was crying and he said, you and mommy are moving to Florida. And he started crying. And that was the most painful thing, my most painful memory that I carried into my teens and my 20s was my dad sitting there crying in his underwear to see such a large personality, such a large man, <clears throat> such a well-loved human. Um, and the man that I looked up to the most in such a vulnerable, weak state, crying like that, ripped me to shreds. And then driving away from the driveway, from our home in Indiana, waving goodbye to my dad and my dog. And in my head, I thought, wow, I really hope he doesn't find new children and replace me. That's what I thought. I was like, I really hope my dad does not replace me. I didn't understand what was going on, but I said to myself in my head, I really hope I see him again. I went from seeing my dad every single day to, to ne not knowing when I'd see him again and not understanding why. And then I went from having two parents to living with my single mom. And she was stressed out. She was scared. She was nervous. And I gave her hell because I was lost. I was confused. I was heartbroken. I was angry. I was upset. And all I wanted was to find joy. And every day I, I just was living in this state of panic and fear. And I remember like gaining a bunch of weight because I would eat for comfort. I was eating and drinking pop for comfort. And we were actually living at, in my aunt's guest bedroom. And my mom and I, I would fight all the time because I straight up hated her for leaving my dad. And I couldn't understand why she left. Well, I kept asking and kept asking and nobody really gave me any answers. What was happening to my dad and why my mom left? My mom basically, in a nutshell, made it very clear that they weren't meant to be in a relationship together. They they loved each other and it was it wasn't my fault. Poppy, no. Sorry guys, the dogs. So anyway, cut, to cut a long long story short, I went back to my dad's every summer and some winters and he progressively got worse. He was talking to himself. He was one year, he was 200 pounds. The next year he was 300. The next year he was 450 pounds and sleeping all day. And then there it got to the point where he would go to the bathroom in his pants or go to the bathroom in his bed because he was so depressed. He didn't want to get out of bed. And finally I had the, the, I didn't even know the questions to ask. And he was living in straight up poverty. And I was sent there every summer and many winters. And he was living in poverty. And I lived there with him for several months. And I was literally taking care of myself as a child and a preteen. And I would literally entertain myself by walking down to the gas station and asking old men for cigarettes. And that's when I started smoking cigarettes. Yeah, I was bored. And I would get on the internet and I would get into chat rooms and I would talk to older men because I was bored. I don't know why older men and I don't know why I was doing what I was doing. I honestly don't know. I was bored and I was looking for some sort of uh, entertainment, somebody to relate to, to talk to. And it wasn't in any healthy way. And so one year I finally asked my dad, I said, dad, on the phone, why aren't you talking? You're just sitting there laughing. Like, what's going on? Please tell me. Now I knew what questions to ask. I was finally old enough to ask the questions. And I said, what's wrong with you? What's happening to you? You know, five years ago, you were my dad and my best friend. And, and now you are, you've got huge dark circles under your eyes. You're constantly shaking and talking to yourself. I've watched you go to the bathroom on yourself. Like, what is happening? And he said, honey, go look, get a dictionary and look up the word schizophrenia. I was by myself in my bedroom. I opened the book and I see schizophrenia. And I'm horrified because the first thing I see is that it's 
hereditary. And I'm like, oh, what? And I read hearing voices, multiple personalities. Most people who are homeless have this. And I am mortified. And I asked my dad, I said, are you hearing voices? Like, and he said, yeah, I, I hear, I hear them all the time. And he, and then there would be months where he would take his medication and he would be doing great. And then there would be months where I wouldn't hear from him for months. And I'd find out he was on the streets or he was in jail because he attacked someone or he was homeless and he was not able to take care of himself. And I was scared of him. And this caused me to have a great deal of anxiety and depression. I started having insomnia by the time I was 15, not sleeping. I would watch MTV till three in the morning and then try to go to school. And then once I was in school, I would sleep on my desk and I already had ADHD and anxiety. So I wasn't paying attention. I was barely making it through the day. And I started to smoke cigarettes to de-stress. And I started drinking alcohol. I would sneak my stepdad's alcohol by the time I was 14 and I'd start drinking. And this was a way for me to number one, feel cool, to feel some sort of purpose, some sort of significance, some sort of ease of anguish and heartbreak. And looking back now as a 38 year old, I'm like, why was I so upset? Whatever. Like my dad was sick, whatever. But when you are a child and that is your world, your parents are your world, when they are sick like that, it is the end of your world. When that person who was your grounding, your informant, your educator, your best friend, the person you looked up to the most, who you, you know, I was daddy's girl. And I felt just so upset with the world. And I carried such resentment towards my mother um, because I felt like she gave up on him. I felt like she was the reason he gave up on himself. I felt like she was the reason he quit on himself. He, She was literally the last woman he was ever with. I felt like she could have done more to help him. And now looking back as a mature adult in many conversations with my mom, she did everything she could and she wanted a better life for me. And she fought to give me a better life in Florida because she didn't want me to be raised by, by in, in a sick a person's home. Um, she didn't want me to live in a small town like that with a sick father and everyone thought he was crazy. She didn't want that for me. And she tried to help him. He had been in and out of hospitals for five years and she stuck it out with him. And unfortunately it didn't work. She did everything she could. And she got to a point where she was like, I have to go find life for myself because he cannot be helped. And as an adult, I forgive her for that. Now I understand. But as a preteen, as a teenager, I had a horrible time getting along with my mom and she was all I had. I'm an only child. I have no siblings. I had nobody to talk to about this, no one to relate with. And into my 20s, I was heavily abusing alcohol, heavily smoking cigarettes, smoking weed and using cocaine to self-medicate because I had no flipping clue why I felt like half the time I wanted to take my own life. I had no idea back then. I said, I don't know why I feel like this. Why are all the, why is everything so cloudy and gray? Why am I so sad all the time? But when I drank, it quieted the voices of anxiety and depression and it quieted that angst and it gave me a feeling of empowerment. So I drank almost every day from the age of 17, 18, sorry, 18 to, I want to say 22, 18 to 22. I wasn't just drinking every day. I was drinking from like 5 PM. The second I got off of work till four in the morning, I would drink an entire bottle of wine just to get to the club that I worked at as a DJ and to just to get to the restaurant I worked at just to function. 
And I had no idea at that point in time that I was abusing alcohol. I thought it was completely normal. I said, oh, this is what people use alcohol for, I guess. So I'm going to do this. And it's the only thing that makes me feel good. That time in my life and that sadness of basically watching my father die slowly over the span of 20 years. While I look back, when I, when I was younger, I looked back at all of that with hatred and anger and I was angry at God and I was angry at the universe and I was angry at my parents and I was angry, just generally pessimistic and mad. Every morning that I woke up, I had this awful mindset that I would say to myself, what's the point of this? Like, why am I here? I have no purpose in life. Nobody's helping me out. I have no money. Like, what is going on? Why am I here? And all of that, I wish I knew then what I know now, that it made me so gosh darn resilient and it made me so strong that when really big shit hit the fan in my adult life, which we'll talk about more in a second, when really big shit hit the fan, I handled it so much better than I than I possibly could have imagined. I've been asked several times by a lot of people, I don't know how you survived what you have been through. And I know that I survived what I've been through because of my upbringing, because I had to grow up really fast. I have been through really tough shit and I've come out of the tough shit successfully and created a life and a family for myself. Now it didn't happen overnight, but through a lot of personal development and journaling and self-help and in and, and research and, and prayer, I was able to create a happy, healthy home with my husband. And I was able to pretty much stop drinking cold turkey the second I got pregnant. And um, I was you know, able to get through a lot of the depression and postpartum depression and things that I struggled with um, as a new mom. And then when I became pregnant with my baby Jack at 30, 32 weeks when I lost him, I got through that. And I thought to myself, I don't know how I, how I got through that the way I did. And now I look back and I'm like, oh, it's definitely because of what I had been through in my upbringing. And so I continued to um, focus on, you know, I continued to focus on personal growth through my 20s and into my 30s. And every time I go through such, such tough situations, whether that's in motherhood, whether that's in business, whether that's in developing um, a business or whether that's seeing people say negative things about me, I react in such a cool, calm, and strong manner. And when I look back in my early 20s and my teens, I was explosive. I would, the smallest thing that would go wrong, I would have the most horrific anxiety. I would have the most awful, just thoughts of despair and anguish and about giving up. And I would explode and get angry anytime somebody upset me. And I, I, you know, looking back at that, I'm like, it's because I wasn't resilient. And now as a 38 year old, I look at life and I'm like, I can conquer anything. I can get through basically anything now from what, you know, after being, having gone through what I've been through. And then when I lost my second baby and my third baby, it was like the experiences with my dad and the experiences with Jack and losing Jack and, you know, finding out he had Down syndrome and going through that loss and delivering him vaginally and then going through the second two losses. Those first, I guess you can say tragedies in my life set me up to handle those, the, the tragedies moving forward. It helped me to get through them in such a stronger way. Um, and so I am so much more resilient 
as an adult. And I know it's because of those tough things that have happened to me. So anytime somebody says, you know, I'm so sorry for your losses. I'm so sorry that you lost your babies. I'm so sorry that you lost your dad. Or I'm so sorry that you've gone through what you've gone through. I'm like, I'm not sorry because I feel so powerful. I feel like if anything is thrown at me, I can conquer it. I'm not scared of life anymore. I'm not scared of the next hat to drop. I don't know if you've ever had this where when life is getting really good, you look around and you go, okay, what's happening next? When's the next tragedy? Life is too sweet. Life is too good right now. When's the next tragedy? I used to think that way in my early, early 20s. And now I don't think that way. That's not a mindset that I have anymore. In, in fact, it's, it's, you know, what's next? Because I can handle it. I can handle anything. And so coming into difficult situations to build businesses and to do, you know, big epic things in, um, in my life as a 38 year old entrepreneur, wife, mom doing epic things. Um, I'm far more resilient. I'm far more consistent. I show up more. And when things hit the fan, when things fall apart, when things aren't going my way, I react in such a calm more laid back manner rather than looking at things and giving up and reacting with a tragedy mindset. I'm more along the lines of, I operate more along the lines of how can I tackle this? How can I best get through this situation and, and create rather than destroy? That's something I learned from Tony Robbins at Unleash the Power Within. He said on stage, Repeat after me. I create, I don't destroy. And I loved that. I loved that. So I carry that with me every day when I'm going through my business and I'm dealing with a lot of different personalities and I'm dealing with up and down, you know, sales numbers and income numbers. And I'm dealing with up and down emotions and people's emotions and personalities. I always try to remember, I create, I don't destroy. And so when I go to tackle something that's really challenging or communicate with somebody that makes me very nervous or have to have a really difficult conversation, I always remind myself, I create, I don't destroy. How can I go about this in a way that is positive, in a way that will bring more creativity and growth? And I, I feel that that has been a huge reason I have been through and weathered the storm of ups and downs in business. I have had businesses fail. I've had businesses explode and fail. I've had the rise and fall of many income streams. And, um, you know, I don't react in terror or the sky is falling or everybody, it's time to jump ship and run. Instead, I say to myself, and everyone around me, what can we do to solve the problem? What can we do to figure this out? Same thing goes with health issues. I've been hit with some health issues um, many times over. I have Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism. Um, I have an, all kinds of issues that relate to those autoimmune diseases or autoimmune issues. And um, in an earlier stage of my life, I would have panicked. But now I'm like, okay, where do we find the solution? Where do we, where do, what do we do to tackle this? And if there is no solution, how can I tackle my mindset? Or, you know, if, even if there is a solution, how do I, I, I work on my mindset through this? How do I see this in a positive light? Because all we can really truly control is what is between our ears. And I know that we can't fully control it because I've been through OCD and intrusive thoughts. I've been through depression. I know we can't control everything, but we can definitely control the narrative of our conscience. We, I, you can definitely control what you consciously tell yourself and remind yourself and what you believe. You can consciously stop and tell yourself rational thoughts and thoughts of positivity and growth. And you can tell yourself, how can I transition into something more of growth than of de destruction. So, you know, I share that story with you about my childhood and about my dad 
and that early difficulty in my life because I truly believe and then going through those years with alcohol abuse and and trauma in my 20s and things like that going through a lot of that I um I share that with you to show you um that strong people come from difficult situations and I want you to remember that and remember my story if you're going through something say a loved one has passed away or you have a diagnosis that you cannot control and you cannot fix the problem. And trust me, I know like this Hashimoto's thing ain't going away for me. I've tried literally everything. It isn't going away. <laughs> and so, you know, and the things that come with Hashimoto's is a pain in my butt, like the depression, anxiety, insomnia, all the things that come with that. It's like, it's challenging. So all of that to say, if you're going through diagnoses or trouble with weight loss or a loved one is is dying or passing away and or your business is failing you've got to stop and and you've got to know that while this is hard i'm becoming stronger i'm becoming more resilient i am my spirit is strengthening and i don't know what you believe in terms of spirituality and the other side or heaven or where we go after this life. But I really believe in my heart that our spirit is here on a mission. It is here on um, a job to grow. And maybe your spirit is very young and maybe your spirit is very new, or maybe you have an old spirit, but no matter what the assignment is, you're here on assignment. And if you're going through something really hard, you're shaping your life here, but you're also shaping your spirit for something else for the next life or what have you or heaven or the spiritual realm or what, whatever you believe. I believe in the spiritual realm. I believe in the other side. I believe that um, there's a lot we cannot see. And I believe our spirits are in this space, in this world, in this um, energetic field to grow and to learn and to um, shape um, our spirits. And this body is just a vessel. So whatever you're going through, you're being shaped. And just remember that even though it probably doesn't make you feel a ton better, um, it can definitely be something that you repeat to yourself as you're going through a really challenging time in your life. And if you're going through a challenging time in your business, know that challenging times in your business are just part of it. It's part of it. And it's going to make you more resilient in your business. It's going to make you more resilient in what you do and, or your job. It's going to make you more resilient as a mom. And so there's no way you can avoid tough situations. There's no way. You can't run away from it. You can't run away from change. You can't avoid problems in life. They are part of life. You can't control what's going to happen to you, but you can control how you react. And if you don't start controlling how you react and controlling how you view things and controlling your mindset around things, at least doing the hard work of reading personal development, journaling, using gratitude, uh, visualization, things like that. If you don't start doing that for yourself now, you're going to become sick. That is where a lot of physical illness comes from. A lot of physical ailments come from stress, anguish, melancholy. And guys, this is totally separate from clinical depression. If you're going through clinical depression, what I'm saying does not really apply. Like if you're going through clinical depression, your brain is lying to you. Your brain is telling you that you, that something's wrong. The world is a terrible place. You're a terrible person. You're not worthy. Dep depression puts a gray cloud over the beautiful world that you live in full of joy and wonder. Um, and so if you're going through clinical depression, what I'm saying kind of helps, but if you can't, if you're not seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist, or you're not receiving medication or some sort of um, therapy work to help you through that, then what I'm telling you isn't going to really help. You've got to do that part. You got to do, you've got to do the fight for your mental health as well. But I truly feel like if you want to avoid future mental health issues or worsening your mental health issues, 
or uh, triggering future mental health issues, you've got to bring yourself some peace. You've got to find peace in your mind and you have to carve out time every day to do something cathartic for yourself, whether that's journaling, exercise, reading. And by the way, when I say exercise, I don't mean exercise for weight loss. I mean exercise for joy and empowerment and health and happiness. When I say, uh, you know, take care of yourself and do something for yourself, I mean healthy things, things that are serving you, not depleting you. But if you don't take time to really focus on providing gentle talk to yourself, providing gratitude within and really shifting your mindset to gratitude, you are going to become sick because you're going to continue to tell yourself things that are going to cause you anguish and stress. And maybe they're, they're real, real thoughts and, and words, or maybe they're not, maybe they're irrational think, you know, it's irrational thinking. It's the sky is falling mentality or you're, you're over and you know, you're over exaggerating the truth about something or over exaggerating the reality about something. And you're causing yourself to feel stress, more stress about a certain situation than you really need to be having stress over. Um, and so when you're living in that toxic anguish and that anger and that, um, that mindset, you are going to continue to cause yourself health issues long term. The more you carry that, I guess you can call it cortisol, that stress in your body, the more you create heart palpitations for yourself, that's that is just going to stack on more health issues, mental and physical. So anyway, all of that to say, remember that tough situations create tough people. And just because you're going through something tough now does not mean you're going to be going through something tough forever. And as you get more resilient and as you get stronger through your tough situations, tough situations become easier to deal with. Isn't that amazing? And you become more resilient and more joyful and life becomes a little bit easier. Um, so just stick it out. I'm telling you right now. I have more, so much more to share with you, uh, but we are way over on time. It's been 37 minutes. Um, but thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. I would love to share more with you about this journey that I've been on and I plan on it. Um, but thank you so much. And I will see you guys on the next podcast episode.